Thank you very much, Juliana. Um, considering the uh, rapid increase of antibiotic resistance of bacteria, we started looking in really much detail how our immune system and particularly how macrophages pick up bacteria because um, our immune system does not distinguish between resistant and non-resistant um, strains. And so it's extremely important to understand much, much more how bac bacteria are picked up by macrophages and how we can maybe, uh, at a later stage, manipulate these processes. So um, the first question I would like to ask is, under what conditions can macrophages win the race against bacterial infections? And um, the, what you see here in the video is a case where you see an infected surface, maybe an implant surface, and then in between you see a macrophage who has a feast. Um, so the macrophage is reaching out, grabbing bacteria, and uh, all these bacteria are firmly adhering to surfaces, yet the macrophage needs to, uh, to pull them off the surface, needs to apply sufficient force to remove them from surfaces. And you see this macrophage is really, really busy. But there's one complication. The bacteria divide every 20 minutes. This is E. coli on a, a surface. So at the end, um, maybe four or six hours later, you see the macrophage was active, but it could not win the race. And um, so this video shows you immediately, it's not a question whether or not you get infected, but it's a question of rates. What is the rate by which bacteria divide? And what is the rate by which macrophages can pick up and clear a certain area? And um, so we are looking now into the processes, what determines the rate? What are the processes involved? And how does some of the um, new novel medication that tries to prevent bacterial adhesion um, impacts this rate of uptake? So um, we essentially um, uh, analyzed many, many of videos um, as shown here um, at high resolution. Again, you see a macrophage. And you see now how the macrophage uh, using philopodia, those are sticky fingers essentially that are extended out of the macrophages. They use these philopodia or sticky fingers to feel their environment. And if they bind to a bacterium like here, the bacterium might wiggle. In this case, the bacterium was lost. But in other cases, it pulls on the bacterium, but um, the forces generated are not sufficient to pull off the bacteria. And, um, but what you also see is that very often, um, the first uh, contact is made with the philopodium. The contact is stable. And then the macrophage is moving towards this bacterium. And finally, phagocytosis, the bacterium. So we analyze many, many of these videos in detail. And what do we see? First of all, we looked into the lifetime. Once a philopodium, such a sticky finger, um, touches a bacterium, how long does it survive? How long can a macrophage hold on to the prey? And you see that if um, the, the sticky finger does not contact the bacterium, then it's protruding and retracted by the cell. But as soon as it touches a bacterium, it can survive for 40 minutes and even longer. So is this surprising or not? Um, very similar experiments were done with um, optical uh, traps. So people coated beads and could also see that if you apply force to the tip of such a sticky finger, then the, the survival length of this finger is much, much greater then if you do not apply force. So there we are very much in agreement with uh, um, additional tools of physical characterization. But then uh, there is something really surprising. So the E. coli has long, long hair on its surface. You see them here um, in this electron micro microscopy image. And um, then the macrophage protrudes these sticky fingers. And so somehow a contact is made between these two structures. And um, the long hair of um, bacteria, they have one receptor only at the tip of these pili of fimbria. And at the tip is one binding pocket. 
And this binding pocket can recognize mannoses. And on the philopodia of macrophages, there is a um, membrane protein, it's called CD48, don't worry about that, but it's highly manosylated. So there is a single protein contact that is formed. And the single protein ligand interaction can survive for 40 minutes or longer, as you've seen. And the question is, why can that be? How can a single contact be so long-lived? So many of you use biotin strep davidine. It, uh, that contact is stable for one or two days. But um, people have also seen that the lifetime of that contact, if you apply force, is shortened to just a minute or so if you apply the force of five piconewtons that is generated by a single motor. So how can this contact survive for so, so long? Um, we discovered um, more, more than 10 years ago that there are receptor ligand bonds that can be force activated. And they can be force activated such that the structure of the binding pocket is switching its um, structural design um, in closing the ligand uh, much better. And with these catch bonds, you can increase the lifetime of the bond by several orders of magnitude. So essentially, um, what enables this long-lived contact is the fact that a catch bond is involved. So um, in the first stage, the finger is um, protruding, contacts a bacterium, but then you see the forces generated are not sufficient to usually move the bacterium on the surface. So something else is needed. So um, therefore, the first part is the macrophages uses the sticky fingers, the philopodium as a hook. And here you can really nicely see it, the philopodium contacting this catch bond um, and thereby pulling on E. coli. But you also see E. coli is attached with many, many bonds to the surface. So somehow this contact alone is not sufficient. Furthermore, if we start pulling um, on this contact, and we simulated that by coating an AFM tip with manos. Yeah, thank you for making this nice invention. And, um, and if we pull on, on this fimbria, what we see is a rapid um, uh, extension of these fimbria, so they start uncoiling, as shown here also in an animation, where if we now and imagine this AFM tip if is the macrophage pulling on these structures, they start to uncoil, or if you let go, they can recoil. So um, these fimbrial structures are designed to allow E. coli to adhere to surface under fluid flow, and then um, if there are forced peaks, um, they are buffered away by these bungee cords of fimbria. So um, in, in the next stage, though, um, we have a nice stable contact. What is happening and necessary for the macrophage to pick up the bacterium? You've seen in the video that after this first contact had been formed, the ma macrophage protrudes its, its um, lamellipodium. And one way to break all these bonds that you would not be able uh, to, uh, to break just by pulling off the bacterium like this, it's like bulk row. You would like to gently open such a contact. The way to do that is that the macrophages pu pushes its lamellipodium underneath and then breaking bond by bond by bond by bond. With that, you do not need a lot of force. And the end result is that the bacterium is moved on top of this lamellipodium, and then the bacterium is phagocytosed. So is this just nice to know? Um, I would now like to show you some data. Um, they are brand new. They are done in collaboration with uh, Brett Nelson, who spoke here um, several times at Cleanup. And essentially, we now want to re replace the bacterium with a carrot. And the carrot is a magnetic bead. And we want to dangle a carrot in front of the macrophage and just see how the macrophage is hunting this carrot. And in order to do that, 
um, they developed a real nice new magnetic tweezer system that has eight coils. And that allows us to have 3D translation and rotational control of the position of the speed. And we can not only use round beads, but elongated beads, like a bacterium. It's a rod-shaped object. And um, we do in the moment nice studies, for example, uh, taking our bead, magnetic bead, and now we move it in front of the macrophage and then essentially just keep it there and watch what the macrophage is doing as a function of time. And here you see how, how the macrophage is now approaching the speed and how it's pushing the bead, how it's pulling the bead, how it tries to grab the bead, but very often it doesn't quite work out um, as anticipated. And finally, the speed is uptaken. Being now an, um, in a magnetic tweezer system, we can certainly quantify the forces, we can quantify the trajectories on space, and maybe just to cut this story short, what is really int interesting, the macrophage does not just grab this carrot like that and pulls back. Um, because most likely the bonds would break. The macrophage grabs the carrot, pushes a little, and then tries to grab it this way. A very different movement from like a dancer than what we had initially anticipated. And then we can quantify now the forces that are involved. So much to the luxury of knowledge. What are the unexpected findings? So um, in order to cope with antibiotic resistance, people develop in the moment soluble inhibitors. Those are manos analogues. They are soluble in the medium, and they compete with the binding pocket. And um, so the thought is that if an E. coli bacterium, for example, um, sees a manosylated surface, and in the urinary tract, many proteins are manosylated, it can adhere to such a surface. And if you now add these soluble inhibitors, then maybe you can prevent it bacterial adhesion in the first place and that, uh, thereby reduce infection rates. A very good thought. But um, what you notice immediately, the soluble inhibitor competes for the binding pocket of FIMH. So it's the same contact that the macrophage is utilizing to, to target adhering bacteria. And what has never been considered before in the design of anti-adhesive drugs is that they might tame the immu our immune response to bacteria. And so we added these soluble inhibitors into the medium and simply asked, how does it change the rate by which the macrophage can take up bacteria? And you see it's greatly, greatly enhanced. So, so far, um, the clinical trials were quite disappointing using these soluble inhibitors. But now you see how the presence of them tames our, the rate by which the macrophages can counteract infections. So another um, effect that you see is um, the effect of antibiotics. So if you have urinary tract infections, you might be treated with a better lactam antibiotic. And um, at high doses, they indeed kill bacteria very efficiently. Now imagine you take an um, antibiotic dose in the morning. You know the concentration in your body is high. And then the concentration is coming down until maybe half a day later you take another pill. What was known already was that if you add um, antibiotics but underdose them to the medium, um, they do not yet kill the bacteria any longer. But what they do is they prevent that bacteria can completely divide. So the division is essentially complete already, but what is lacking is the ability to pinch off the membrane. So um, what the bacteria grow into these long rods. And we were asking if they form these long filaments, how does it impact our immune response? So what you see here is a macrophage trying to approach one of these um, E. coli filaments. So you see individual E. coli and then this long filament. And here the macrophage, and this video takes 40 minutes, is approaching this filament. It's pulling on this filament. Um, the forces generated are not even high enough to break the filament. 
And at the end, the macrophage was not successful in digesting the filament. So this is something not at all considered in the way of how we dose antibiotics, how we try to keep certain uh, concentration high enough so that filamentation cannot occur. So is filamentation complete protection? No, it is not. So what you see is that if the macrophage can approach this rod-like structure from the pole, in that moment it can form this actin ring and, um, and just suck in this entire filament. And um, then all bacteria are of the filament are phagocytosed. If we drop the um, antibiotic concentrations even lower, then um, this pinching off can occur and every one of these bacteria can survive individually and further infection. So um, for the time period where the antibiotic concentrations are sufficiently low, um, but not too low, the filaments might allow certain bacteria to survive for an extended time period. So why is this interesting? Um, in addition to what we see with E. coli, um, nice research has also been done on drug delivery systems. Most of them are spherical. But what happens if you make elongated drug delivery systems? And um, so, so um, this group in Santa Barbara um, they engineered nanopartic uh, micron particles uh, with high aspect ratios, and they essentially independent, despite the fact that the surface chemistry is so very different, they saw exactly the same rules that, again, the macrophages can only digest these particles if they come from the pole. And um, elongated um, drug delivery system seem to have a longer circulation time in the body. So, um, to sum up, antibiotics have really rescued millions of lives, but what comes next? And if you ask this question, there are no good alternative therapies, despite the fact that no new antibiotics are uh, coming on the market. So, in order to make progress in this field, I think we need to, in detail, understand the mechanisms involved and hopefully come up with new strategies just by looking in detail how these processes work. Then we might come up with new approaches to inhibit them, but without um, affecting our immune cells to deal with infections. With that, I would like to thank the collaborators, um, and particularly all the graduate students and postdoc who put enormous uh, amount of time and effort and joy into this project. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Viola, for the very interesting presentation. Please. Oh, yeah, sorry. Uh, it was a really fascinating presentation. I was wondering, the, the video that you had with the, um, the filamented bacteria and the macrophage trying to phagocyte it or trying to pick it up and it, and it can't actually manage it, for me, brings to mind uh, the, the frustrated phagocytosis you see where macrophage is trying to engulf nanofibers. And they, uh, but when they can't engulf the, um, the fiber, they just release a lot of inflammatory mediators. Do you see that same kind of thing in that situation with the filament, with the filament bacteria? Yeah. In, in the context, we looked at uh, uptake of rod-like micron and nanoparticles. And uh, on the nanoparticle literature, um, for certain nanoparticles, spherical nanoparticles, certainly it's endocytosis, not phagocytosis. Uh, with long rod-like structures, it's not as clear. And um, <coughs> so for uh, processes uh, that are mediated through endocytosis, um, we have no data in the moment. Um, for phagocytosis, it's a geometrical consideration and constraint that to, it seems to determine um, the processes. So the surface chemistry um, allows to create a sticky surface. So macrophages might have a higher chance to pull and apply sufficient force. But once the phagocytotic ring, um, this actin ring is formed around, the speed by which um, synthetic 
and bacterial filament is taken up um, seems to be the same. Yeah, great work, thank you very much. I was just wondering, um, if you think that the two-dimensional in vitro uh, system as you use for your studies is a good representative of what happens really uh, during uh, uh, bacterial infections in humans, and secondly, I was also wondering if in a three-dimensional system, the dynamics of you know, the force applied may change uh, even dramatically compared with what you, what you show today. So um, uh, we started out with a flat surface, um, simply because uh, you see that we did not label the cell membranes because we always, um, after a certain time period, saw some phototoxicity, which turned the macrophages into lame ducts. And so we needed uh, really flat surfaces to, to even use um, DIC imaging um, with this resolution. And you see Philopodia plays such a big role. We tried um, a little to put um, macrophages into cell-derived extracellular matrix. And um, so far, we have not been successful because the macrophages um, very rapidly were tearing apart the extracellular matrix fibers themselves. So in that sense, I cannot yet uh, answer your question um, how this process will be. Um, what has not been considered, though, in infections and the rates of clearance really has been this force component and how the angle by which you apply the force might matter. And that certainly will change if a bacterium is sitting on a flexible fiber um, where the fiber can also be distorted. So in the moment, I don't know um, how, how it would, will work out. I, I actually had the same question, but uh, I phrased it differently. Uh, a bacterium in, in real life, I mean, how would it stick to some, some in the, I mean, did anybody study that, how they, actually can grab something or hold on at, at certain surfaces. Mm -hmm. Is there any idea about that? Mm -hmm. So in real life, um, or coming also back to this other question, uh, a, urinary, a, a catheter surface, for example, is a flat surface, and it usually gets infected after three or four days. So there, um, we mimic that. Um, in terms of receptors, bacteria have all kinds of appendices, so they can um, e. coli can nicely bind to monoisolated surfaces, but also galactose and ma many other receptors that are presented. And in part, even the nutrition that bacteria get determine which of these uh, uh, fimbria are, are expressed or not expressed. So um, the catalog of receptor ligand interactions that can form are large. And um, people also quoted the um, the surfaces with cut ionic lip um, polymers, and that also can pin down bacteria very nicely. So uh, uh, depending now on surface charges, um, different mechanisms might play an important role. Okay, one more question. Thanks for an excellent presentation. I just wanted to ask you regarding the generation of a biofilm in a time scale. If we think about the interaction between the macrophage and the bacterium, uh, when the biofilm comes to, to a play, because interactions are somehow far from the reality in terms of what's going on, for example, in the biomaterial. Mm -hmm. This is uh, an excellent question. This was essentially only our warm-up experiment to get to your question, because depending now on uh, what type of bacteria, E. coli itself does not form these um, sticky, gluey biofilms, so it's a good example there. But um, once a biofilm forms, um, bacteria encase themselves and probably also protect themselves from macrophage attack, but we would like to really see uh, how macrophages deal with biofilms, so we have a first set of experiments set up to look into that right now. Thanks very much. Okay, thank you very much, Viola. Uh,